5,300 miles west of the California Sierra Nevada foothill town of Gold Hill, an historic drama was taking place. The Japanese Boshin Civil War was coming to a close. The unintended consequences of the Boshin Civil War would alter world history for the next century. The feudal shogunate government had lost face as Western influence flooded Japan. In the hopes of restoring Japanese sovereignty, the Civil War was fought to replace the shogunate with the restoration of the emperor. One of the last feudal fortresses to fall was that of Lord Matsudara, Azu's castle. Wakamatsu province would now be controlled by the new Meiji government. During the Boshin Civil War, John Henry Schnell, a Prussian national working under German diplomat Max von Brandt, had supplied Matsudora with military equipment. For his services to the shogunate, John Henry Schnell was given the honorary rank of samurai and permitted to take a Japanese wife. Lord Matsudaria and Schnell had a business plan. In the hold of the SS China Clipper were stored 50,000 mulberry trees, 6,000 tea seeds, and silkworm cocoons. Because both silk and tea were in demand in the United States, their goal would be to establish a Japanese farming community in the mining town of Gold Hill in El Dorado County. If the plan succeeded, maybe Lord Masutaria could also join them in California. To help oversee their daughter, Frances, the Schnells brought on board their 17-year-old nursemaid, Oki San. Oki's life story would become folk legend in both the American Japanese communities, but also in Japan. The Schnells would celebrate the birth of a second daughter, Mary, in California. Mary Schnell would be the first child of Japanese heritage to be born in America. The refugees included at least two samurai, one member of the Matsudaria clan, three carpenters, one physician, plus several Japanese families and their children. Of the two fleeing samurai, Matsusakari would assume a leading role in the future of the farm. The idea of establishing a silk farm was not far-fetched. On August 26, 1866, the Daily Alta California newspaper reported that Mr. L. Prevost of San Jose, a well-known expert on silk, felt that California was well-suited to establish a silk industry. He was quoted as saying, we could supply the whole world. Sacramento Daily Union, June 8, 1869. The agents of some Japanese now on their way to California have purchased the farm near Gold Hill, El Dorado County, as the nucleus of a settlement for tea and silk culture, which is soon to be extended over an area of 10,000 acres in that one district. Just two miles from the town of Coloma, the site of John Marshall's 1847 discovery of gold, lies the town of Gold Hill. Schnell paid $5,000 for 200 acres of land, plus a few outbuildings. Here, the refugees hoped to strike it rich, not in gold, but in silk and tea. Today, California has a population of almost 39 million people. Not only is California the largest state by population, but California is also the seventh largest economy in the world. Her citizens have been drawn from every culture and corner of the world. 
the California of the 19th century would be just as foreign to us as the Wakamatsu refugees must have found their new home. They spoke Japanese, not English. Their Buddhist and Shinto heritage had no parallels in California. Mining was a foreign occupation as Japan had few natural resources. They were strangers in a foreign land. 150 years ago, California's total population was only 560,000 people. The population of rural El Dorado County consisted of only 10,000 individuals. 1,500 Chinese made up the largest ethnic minority. The residents of El Dorado County made their living either mining or ranching. The last leg of the refugees' journey to their new home in Gold Hill would be by wagon train. At last, their journey was over, exhausted. The 22 refugees must have paused as they looked out on 200 acres of ranch land. The previous owner had constructed a ranch house plus a few outbuildings. Today, the ranch is owned by the American River Conservancy. The Conservancy is dedicated to preserving the rich history of the first Japanese colony in the United States. The ARC conducts scheduled tours of this historical site. Herb Tanamoto will be our docent today. I'm doing this, but I consider it fun because it's uh, so important to me. I'm standing underneath this kiaki tree. Uh, it's a species of Japanese elm. I already told some people how old it is, but those people sh keep quiet. I'll ask, uh, <laughs> how old do you think this kiaki tree is? Any guess? 150. All right. Well, 150 is pretty close because it, um, when the Japanese first came here in 1869, they planted this tree uh, when the Japanese colony came here. And so, depending on how old it was when they planted it, it was probably just a sapling a year or so old. So it makes it about 146 years old, I guess. But it's a symbol of, uh, um, of their hometown, that's why they planted it. They wanted a reminder of what, what home was like um, because they left uh, hurriedly because of the, of the war. They were refugees, uh, uh, these colonists from Wakamatsu, refugees of a war. With high expectations, the small group of colonists began the arduous task of creating an utopian Japanese agricultural colony. Their new land needed to be cleared and the crops planted as well as constructing new buildings. They would need a cocoonery to raise and breed silkworms. The 1868-1869 California State Agricultural Society report gave full support for establishing tea farms in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. We call upon the legislature that the western slope of the Sierras running the whole length of the state is as well adapted to the production of this article as any country named. We now call attention to the fact that since that time, a company of Japanese tea culturists have come to our state. They have located in El Dorado County where they have purchased considerable land and planted a small tea nursery. Though their arrival here was quite late in the season and their commencement consequently was made under very unfavorable circumstances, their experiences so far gives them great encouragement and promises final success. They escaped from a civil war. They made an arduous journey into the unknown. They gave two years of laborious work. Yet, all their efforts to create an utopian Japanese colony in the foothills 
of the Sierra Nevada would end in failure. Except for two of the original colonists, all the refugees would disperse, either becoming part of the cultural quilt that is today California, or return to their native Japan. Their expectations for success far exceeded reality. Having arrived late in the season, the refugees faced their first ordeal, drought. Both farming and mining required copious amounts of water. Irrigation canals would have had to have been constructed. One can assume the local miners, who also needed water for their operations, would not have been too cooperative. Other reasons for the demise of the Wakamatsu farm were documented in a book written in 1883. Because of the poor quality of seed they brought from Japan, their first crop failed. Other misfortunes doomed the project. Miners infringed on their property, damaging the soil and uprooting their crops. With their first crop of failure, the farm needed a quick infusion of money. Facing foreclosure, John Schnell and his family left the farm. He was never seen again. Herb Tanamoto continues the story. The miners, too. Um, they had also had problems of funding. When Lord Matsudaira surrendered in Japan, he gave up all his wealth because they told him, either you be give up your wealth and become a priest or you have to commit suicide. So he decided to become a priest and give up his wealth. So they, uh, the colony here ran out of funding. So they had to forfeit uh, on, their, on their loan. And, uh, and uh, when they did, the Verkamp family took over. This is a picture of the Verkamp family, probably around 1880. Uh, Francis and, uh, and, and his wife, and they had, they had six sons. They didn't, have, they didn't have any surviving daughters. Um, they were a German family, and they farmed this land, uh, agri both agriculture and cattle, for, a, for over 140 years. And it was from the birth of Matsu would live on the ranch for the next 30 years. He was a diligent worker who had become the Verkamp's distribution manager. The Verkamp's owned not only the Wakamatsu property, but also invested in produce and fruit orchards. Okisan would also continue living on the ranch, providing help overseeing the Vanderkamp's children. the most legendary figure here was uh, uh, just a, actually a, a babysitter. Uh, she was a, a, a nanny for uh, the Verkamp uh, children, uh, two infant daughters of theirs. And, uh, but she came uh, not because she wanted to. She wasn't kind of a real pioneer at heart, I think. She came because it was her duty uh, to uh, both Lord Matsudaira and to the Schnells, who, uh, the family that she knew. And so when she came here, um, she was very homesick. Uh, uh, she was a simple Japanese girl uh, from everything that we know of. And, uh, and after her chores were done, uh, late in the day, she'd come up to this knoll here, uh, which is the highest area uh, in this, this side of the property. Uh, and she would look back across uh, kind of the saddle, back, to, back west, back to the east, uh, where she could think about Japan and her home that she really missed. And she'd sit and um, contemplate, and uh, they say she, she uh, sang children's songs. And, uh, so it was her favorite place. Um, unfortunately, she had a short life here. Uh, only a couple years. Uh, she was 17 when she came and she died when she was 19 in, uh, in 1871. Um, they think uh, she might have had malaria. Uh, that might have been 
uh, how she died. She had a fever for quite a long period of time. Um, what, what, after she died, um, the Verkamps buried her here. And uh, there was just a simple marker at first, just a wooden marker. Then many years later, a, her friend, um, uh, whom we talked about in the house, uh, Matsunosuke Sakurai, the samurai, um, was a good, good friend of hers. Uh, he was able to get, get enough funding together to uh, purchase uh, a stone, permanent stone marker. Even that stone marker kind of disintegrated over time and it had a big crack in it. Now it's in safe storage and the exact reproduction was made. And in fact, uh, even uh, recently there was a, a pop song that was released mm. oh. uh, that did well in Japan about uh, OK and about mm. Gold Hill. And, uh, wow. and uh, I think the reason Japanese connect with OK is because she came because it was her duty, as a sense of duty and honor. And that's really an important thing to, uh, to Japanese. And she sacrificed that, uh, her, kind of her happiness in J Japan to, to be here, uh, to fulfill that. When we think of Japan today, we visualize a modern industrialized state. During the first two decades of the Meiji period, large industrialized manufacturing did not exist. Rather, small family enterprises were the rule rather than the exception. The goal of the Meiji government was to transform Japan into an industrial military power equal to any European nation or to the United States. It wasn't until 1886 that Japan would make her entry into the Industrial Revolution. To fulfill her ambition, Japan would need what she did not have, raw materials. What she lacked, her neighbors had. As a result, between 1890 and 1905, Japan would be entangled in wars with China, Korea, and Russia. Her military successes would transform Japan into an empire. By 1931, the Japanese Empire would extend from Manchuria in the north to the island of Taiwan in the south. In 1898, the United States defeated Spain in the Spanish-American War. The Philippines became an American protectorate. Now facing each other, the United States and Japan would enter a new adversarial relationship. In the 1820s, the first missionaries brought their Bibles in an earnest desire to Christianize the islands. The children of the missionaries, however, were captivated by capitalism. There was money to be made in sugar. The problem was that the indigenous people of the islands did not have an appetite for the laborious and dangerous work of plantation life. 
The planters turned to China for cheap labor. The Chinese who arrived worked hard, saved their money, and as soon as they could, abandoned the sugarcane fields. Others booked passage to California. Eugene Van Reed was Hawaii's counsel in Japan. Van Reed, an American expatriot, sold the Hawaiian government on the idea of using Japanese labor to fulfill the planters' needs. The request was for 350 immigrants. Van Reed could only muster 148 recruits. Their pay would be $4 per month, plus room and board, and round-trip passage. Each worker agreed to a three-year contract. Unfortunately, Van Reed gathered his workers from the streets of Yokohama. The urban recruits from the streets of Yokohama were unsuited for the arduous tasks assigned to them on the sugarcane plantations. The first experiment in Japanese contract labor was a total failure. While the first experiment in contract labor was a failure, it was not forgotten. The Meiji government was in financial distress. Wars do not come cheaply. In 1885, the Meiji government signed a three-year agreement with the Kingdom of Hawaii. 30,000 Japanese indentured poor tenant farmers crossed the ocean to work on the Hawaiian plantations. The government's reasoning was simple. Remitted money back to Japan would be an economic boost to the Japanese economy. Exporting indentured farm workers would yield millions of yen to the Japanese economy. As long as the Kingdom of Hawaii was an independent nation, Hawaiian exported sugar would have to pay a high tariff as the sugar entered the United States. To avoid the tariff, the plantation owners engineered a coup d'etat overthrowing the lawful government of Hawaii. In 1898, the new Hawaiian government then requested President McKinley to accept Hawaii as a new territory of the United States. Once Hawaii became a territory of the United States, indentured labor became unlawful. Under United States constitutional law, Japanese workers and their families were now free to leave for the United States mainland and in particular, California. For the next 25 years, 100,000 Japanese migratory workers would enter the United States either through Hawaii or come directly from Japan. Japanese farm laborers who never had an opportunity to own land of their own in Japan could invest their savings and pursue the American dream. In part three, we will delve into the struggle for equality and how California did everything possible to thwart their dreams. A full collection of videos covering the history and ecology of the American River Basin can be found on my website www.youtube.com slash user slash Michael Stark One. They may also be found on YouTube under Roseville TV. Become involved in protecting and preserving both our history and our watershed. Visit us on our website www.drycreekconservancy.org. Thank you.